All right, so good morning, everybody. I am Jesse Wittish with Kentucky Youth Advocates. Thank you to all of you for joining us today on the morning after the election. We appreciate you spending time with us, and uh, we are grateful to spend time with you. So we are recording today's workshop to share later. Um, so just a heads up that we ask you to stay muted. But we are taking questions and comments via the chat feature. Um, we're holding five, 10 minutes at the end for questions. But as you think of questions, please feel free to go ahead and drop them into the chat. Um, and we're kind of keeping track of those throughout today's workshop. Um, also, if you have a question that you maybe don't feel comfortable asking the entire group, because we know we're talking about self-care today, there may be some topics you don't want everyone to see, please feel free to um, like send uh, me, uh, the host, a private message and um, we'll frame that in a way that doesn't like reveal who asked that question. So um, please feel free to do that. So today we're departing a bit from our usual forum format and instead of talking about taking action for kids, we are going to talk about how to take action for ourselves. Um, but we're doing that so that we can be better advocates for kids and families. So like everyone, uh, we as advocates have been experiencing a lot of stress over the past few months and a uh, few weeks, I think, especially with the, all that's been kind of uh, ramping up. And it's important that we continue to care for ourselves so that we can maintain the energy that we need to continue our advocacy on behalf of Kentucky kids. So our trainer today is Dr. Joe Bargione. He's a licensed psychologist and certified school psychologist, and he was the lead psychologist for 25 years with Jefferson County Public Schools. He is on the leadership team of and a trainer for the Bounce Coalition. Uh, the Bounce Coalition builds the resiliency of children, adults, and families by improving knowledge about the impact of adverse childhood experiences and the skills to help people bounce back from adversity. And one of the ways that they help folks build that um, like resiliency is through trainings like we're having today. And we at Kentucky Youth Advocates are honored to serve as the backbone, backbone organization for the Bounce Coalition. So with that, I am gonna turn it over to Dr. Joe Bargeum. Thank you, Jesse. I appreciate uh, you turning it over to me. And uh, when we had planned to do this training a while back, uh, we, we thought it was a good idea. So I credit you folks at KYA for thinking ahead and doing some of that long-term strategic thinking. But now that in our current situation, I think it's even more appropriate uh, to do the, the, the self-care training today because I always tell people, whether you're an advocate or you're an educator or you you work in social services and you work with kids and families, I always say we have to be at our best to do our best. And that really focuses on self-care. So we're gonna spend some time this morning, I have a, a PowerPoint presentation I'm gonna pull up in just a moment. And I'd like, um, and I'll be, we'll be sharing that with you um, at a later, you know, af after this is over. So feel free to, um, to look at that the slide deck and do what you want with that. So that will make that available to you. So um, I'm gonna pull up my, my PowerPoint. And I'm gonna assume everybody can see my PowerPoint. Okay, so that, that's, so the title is self-care during the pandemic and an election and self-care, it's more than deep breathing, essential oils and chocolate. It seemed like in our chat box, I saw some chocolate related comfort foods, um, but we're gonna have to do more than just um, eat our stress foods. So, but hopefully um, some of the stuff you may already know, but it's nice to hear it. Sometimes it's reinforcing some of the strategies you already do, or hopefully there may be one or two takeaways from what I share with you or some other folks share with you um, during, in the chat box that hey, I may try that strategy myself. Um, so that's, so we hope to do this all by the end of the hour. So what do we hope to do? Um, anytime I do trainings, I'm always asked, you know, you always have to include learning objectives. So 
hopefully we'll all know what some of the warning signs of stress are and secondary trauma, being that we're advocates for kids and families. What is self-care? What's involved with self-care? And then thinking about creating a self-care plan, or if you already have one in place, do you want to revise it or modify it based upon some of the information I'm sharing with you uh, this morning? So anytime I do trainings around self-care or sometimes emotionally charged um, topics, it's always you take universal precautions. So be good to yourself this morning. Obviously, take care of yourself, maintain a safe and positive space, and don't stress. But my, my suggestions that you do today, if anything's, um, anything I'm sharing with you, or if you start to have some strong responses, please do one of three things. One, the first thing is, if you want to take a break, maybe mute me um, so you don't hear my voice, and, but you can still see the content in the PowerPoint. That's one option. The second option is walk away from, the, from your computer or your tablet right now for a few minutes and collect yourself. And then if you think it's appropriate and you feel you're in a better space, come back to the training. And then the third option is if you're not able, you know, if you're really having a difficult time, and some of us may be, then that's okay. Then you can turn it off. And it's my understanding KYA is recording this event. So you can then go to their website and listen to it. And we'll also be uploading the PowerPoint. So those are three options you can use to make sure you take care of yourself. And the next thing, unfortunately, uh, Jesse kind of stole my thunder a little bit about doing an icebreaker at the beginning. That is okay, Jesse. I, I understand. And so, um, so my icebreaker to everybody kind of deals with, if you got a fresh tray of brownies coming out of the oven, I mean, they smell great, right? Now, the first piece you take off the, the tray of brownies, are you a corner, pers a corner piece person or are you a middle piece person? So if you would put those, your responses in the chat box, that would be great. Unfortunately, I can't see the chat right now. Is it, how's it breaking? Is it corners or middles or about average, about even? It looks about even uh, to me. Okay. Okay. All right. But that, I mean, when you talk about stress, you know, some of us, when we're in a stressful situation, stress food, and I contend that, and there's some literature behind this, that a lot of times your stress food, you can relate it back to when you were a child, that comfort food. So I think in, uh, Jesse, when you did this earlier, I thought I saw somebody say mashed potatoes, right? And so um, a lot of times our stress food, if you really look at it, we probably go back to some of those comfort foods when we were a child. Okay. All right. So one of the things I want to do now is just to talk about, you know, everybody on this call uh, today is an advocate. And so I have the formal definition of what advocacy is, and according to the dictionary, folks, it's the act, of the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal, the act of advocating. Okay, that's the, formal present, that's the formal definition of what advocacy is and what you do every day to support your kids and families that you work with. But I think there's really a more um, ground level definition of, of what advocacy is in my mind. And I think advocacy is really all about education with passion, right? And so I didn't steal, I'm stealing this from an advocate I've known. Uh, this person has been an advocate in Kentucky for over 40 years around health policies for kids and families. Um, and I'll go ahead and give a shout out to the person, but some of you folks may know Sheila Schuster, who's a psychologist who does some, a lot of work in, uh, in Frankfurt around advocating for kids and families around policy and stuff. But I really liked her definition better about definition for advocacy versus the formal definition in, um, in the dictionary. It's education with passion, whether it's uh, uh, providing education for your clients and your, um, the people you work with, or you're trying to influence decision makers or policy makers, right? It's all about educating people so they can make better decisions either about themselves or about others if I'm in the position of power, okay? So, Advocacy is education with power. Okay. What I'd like to do now with what's all going on 
with the, um, with the pandemic, uh, I want to do two quick polls and, and Carly's going to help us with this. And so this first poll is how are your clients or families feeling, uh, the families you interact with? So how are your clients or families you interact with? And if you would just respond to one of those for Okay. We'll give people a, a little bit longer. People are still voting. Okay. All right, voting has slowed down. So. Okay. We'll go ahead and use these numbers right now. So if I can do a quick math calculation, um, when we're thinking in terms of how are our clients feeling or, or the people we support, I kind of have two positive uh, statements and two, and two negative statements of how people are feeling. And so it looks like, unfortunately, at this time, uh, we are about, we are about 60% are our clients are feeling sad or angry and about 40% uh, are feeling upbeat and strong, okay? So let's see if we see some similar findings when we think in terms of ourselves. So if we would pull up the second category, the second one, which is, um, how are you feeling right now? Okay, so let me do a quick calculation. Actually, if, if I did my quick calculation, we're kind of feeling the same way as most of our clients and people we're advocating for in that I think we're at about 59% uh, we're feeling sad or angry at this point, and we're at 41% um, feeling upbeat or strong. And that's pretty close to what our clients were feeling. With our clients, it was 40% upbeat and strong versus us being 41%. So you can just see, based on this information, when we're thinking in terms of ourselves, when six out of 10 of us are feeling sad or angry, that's gonna impact the way we support our clients. And we know, you know, for us to be effective advocates, we have to be at our best to give our best to them. So I think that's a really, these are some good data that suggests that self-care is a thing we need to be looking at to be able to support ourselves so we can support others. So thank you for sharing um, the results in the poll. So what I'd like to do now is to continue with the presentation. And so there's actually some literature out there and there's some research out there about right now telling us how are kids and adults feeling during the pandemic. So I just want to give you two short studies that shows the impact the pandemic's having on our kids and our, the people and the adults that we're supporting. So the first set of data comes from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and this was on, in July. And just a couple of points I want to make here is that when parents were reporting about their kids, they were sharing with us that more than one in four parents reported worsening mental health in their children and one in seven parents reported worsening behavioral health in children. 
And behavioral health is a broader category than mental health. Mental health is like the psychological well-being of kids, but behavioral incorporates both the mental health, but also physical health. So parents are really concerned about their kids' health in general. Then the second one is con uh, really kind of concerns me, especially if you work with early childhood or um, in, um, it, with really young kids and that families with younger children had the highest rates of declining mental health and behavioral health in kids. So what does it tell us about our adults also? So we know it's impacting our kids. What does the, uh, the data tell us about our adults that we work with and ourselves actually? And this data comes from the Journal of the American Academy of Me the American Medical Association. And they did a comparison study of adults before and during the pandemic. And what they found was they found an increase of threefold for people experiencing depression. So that was really significant. And then the second point I want to draw your attention to is lower income adults, those are defined as with less than $5,000 in savings, have an exposure to more stressors were associated with greater risk of depression during the pandemic, okay? And so rhetorically, the question for you is, do any of your families fall into that category? And I contend, you know, whether you work in social services or healthcare or education or advocacy areas, you probably do work with a lot of families who are due to the pandemic, and they're probably on the line anyway uh, with fi financial stability or insecurity before the pandemic. And, you know, there's some information about, they say that about 40% families, if they had a $400 un unanticipated expense, that they don't have money to cover that, okay? So you can see that many of our parents and our families are experiencing financial insecurity. Um, and many of our parents, they're being disproportionate. The poorer people or people maybe who work in the service industry um, either lost their job or they have to go to work where some of us, if, if we have maybe a different type of job where we can work from home. But if you're in the service industry, you can't work from home. You, you have to work with the people that you serve. So that disproportionately falls down more on our people with less financial resources. So you can see that those are some significant issues that we're dealing with. And there's the inequity issues and the social justice issues that revolve around that. So let's actually talk a little bit about warning signs. and. We can, we can spend a whole hour just on the warning signs, but I just want you to think in terms of, there are four buckets of warning signs, okay? There's the cognitive symptoms, which is like memory problems or inability to concentrate or focus, poor judgment, uh, racing thoughts, okay? That falls in the area of problem solving and thinking. Flip over to the right, you see emotional symptoms of stress. And that could be moodiness, irritability, agitation, you're not able to relax or you know, settle down, a sense of loneliness and isolation. I think a lot of us are experiencing that, those symptoms right now being that um, we have to be socially distant and our typical ways of us interacting with other people at work has dramatically changed. So much of that now, unless you, you're with your immediate family or a small part of people you can trust with, the, with not getting the virus, a lot of your interactions with other folks is now done virtually and that can have an impact so you can see some of the emotional symptoms of that and then if you go to the bottom left we have the physical symptoms and that's aches and pains digestive issues nausea chest pains loss of sex drive uh frequent colds i think what's going on um you know a lot of people's immune systems are going down and now we're going to the cold and flu season um so i think you know will we see more some people say we might see a little less on the flus because so many of us are doing the socially distance and isolating ourselves um, and following the CDC guidelines. So over the next couple of months, we'll be seeing uh, if that bears out that situation. So you can see those are some of the physical symptoms. And then the last bucket of symptoms that we have are the behavioral symptoms. And that's, I talked, we talked a little bit about our stress eaters, right? And so we know about our eating patterns, eating too much or eating, not eating enough, okay? Sleeping too much or not sleeping enough or having a fitful sleep. Um, sleep hygiene is so critical to us and to our well-being, and even our kids too, that many of our kids don't get enough sleep, not because they're not sleeping the eight hours or 10 hours, but because they don't have a good deep sleep, 
throughout that time. So we can be sleeping too much, too little, or we're not sleep, we're not getting quality sleep. Isolating ourselves from others, procrastinating or neglecting responsibilities. And we'll talk about the neglecting responsibilities in a little bit more detail about there's so many things on our plates right now. So how do we manage that while we also have our other responsibilities to our family, you know, to reckon, reckon leisure and, and, and other folks. So we'll talk more about that when we talk about the self-care plan. And then nervous habits, nail biting, pacing, obsessive thoughts or compulsive behaviors. And then also we're seeing an increase of use of um, alcohol and cigarettes and drugs that could be over the counter medications or be prescription privileges or illegal drugs. So think in terms of the warning signs of stress, it's really in four areas, cognitive, emotional, physical, and behavioral. I wanna also spend a moment on just talking about secondary trauma. And so many of you folks have your own definition of this, or this may be new to some folks. So my working definition of secondary trauma is this. Secondary trauma involves folks who experience a traumatic event in an indirect way. And what I mean by that is that you are not the person who experienced that traumatic experience, but you are then working with that person who experienced that traumatic event. So the original studies that came out with post-traumatic stress disorder revolved around uh, folks in the military and veterans, all right? And so many times, obviously, they had the direct exposure to that traumatic event. And it could be an isolated incident or it could be a chronic, uh, multiple incidents over a long period of time. So you see some of those post-traumatic stress disorders in the folks who experienced the event itself. You can see these groups of folks also at high risk for that secondary trauma where I didn't experience it myself directly, but I'm hearing the stories from the people I work with. And I just want to draw your attention. You can see some of the ones you would typically think, like physicians and counselors and veterans and nurses and firefighters and first responders. But I also want to draw your attention to a couple of groups, educators. Uh, we're talking about teachers and people who work in education or with childcare. And you can see that's the next one, child welfare workers. So if we have folks who work for the cabinet or with CPS, you know, these are individuals who are working day in, day out with some really high, highly volatile situations. And so sometimes if we're not practicing good self-care and taking care of our own needs, we start, to experience, we start to display some of those same characteristics as somebody who experienced that event directly, okay? Um, so you could be a, a, you know, you could work for the cabinet, you could, you could be a teacher, you could be a victim's advocate. You know, if you work for a shelter, you know, or a rape center, you know, you're hearing all those stories from your clients day in, day out. So these are groups that are at higher risk for secondary trauma. The other piece around secondary trauma I want bring to your attention is compassion fatigue. And compassion fatigue is our ability to, to be genuine and empathetic towards the clients that we're working with. And when we're not able to do that, that impacts our relationship and our ability to advocate or interact with those around us. It's almost like you just get burned out, okay? And it may not be intentional the way you interact with your clients, but they can pick up on that. It could be the way you talk to them or your body positioning or nonverbal gestures, okay? Or sometimes you can almost let it slip like, if you just stop doing that inappropriate behavior, you'd be in a much better place. So unfortunately, with the folks on this group, uh, you can see on this page, they're at high risk for secondary trauma, but also compassion fatigue. And either one of that, of those characteristics or uh, problems we're having, impacts us, but it also impacts the individuals that we're, we're there to support, okay? So those are some of the, the issues uh, that we're faced with. So what I'd like to do now is just kind of get a sense from you folks in the chat box is how do you, how is your emotional gas tank right now? So if you, if you folks would just put in the chat box, like how do you know your gas tank is empty? You know, your psychological wellness or your emotional, you know, your resiliency and adaptive skills. How do you know your gas tank is empty? What are some of the signs you see in yourself? If you would put those in the chat box, that would be great. OK. 
okay. I'm just having a little difficulty seeing the chat box right now. So what are some of the comments we're seeing there? Carly, can you help me with that, please? Yeah, so it looks like um, we have a lot of people who um, kind of experience irritability um, when, when they uh, fill their gas tank becoming empty. And then we see some kind of physical reactions as well. So stomach aches and heart races and those kind of things. Um, a lot of like kind of cranky and short tempered kind of goes along with irritability. Um, and then just kind of in general, um, lack of interest or lack of motivation um, in, in kind of what they're doing, whether that's okay. work or life. Um, so yeah, those are some of the themes. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. And so just from hearing uh, what some of the things we're seeing in the chat box, it kind of breaks down into two, two areas, physical symptoms, right? Uh, where heart racing, or we might have some of the physical characteristics of anxiety. Um, but then also the psychological aspects or the behavioral aspects when we're talking about, you know, temper and irritability and anger and all those kinds of things. So uh, those are really important things to know when your, your tank is empty. I also encourage you that many of us, you know, we work with other people with the organization. So especially if you're in leadership, if you're a supervisor, it's really good to know if some of the people that report to you or if I have a coworker, Am I seeing some of these warning signs in my colleagues or the people I supervise that, you know, it seems like their tank is emptying a little bit. So I do appreciate everybody sharing with me and we are going to see physical characteristics and then also the emotional or the behavioral characteristics of um, an empty tank. So this is where we now turn towards what can we do um, to deal with these um, physical complaints we're having and the, the secondary trauma or compassion fatigue and the anxiety. And it really comes down to creating that self-care. And I really love this, this picture and hopefully everybody can read it. I think a lot of us are practicing a, a lot of self-care practices right now. And many of us are doing, hopefully we're doing more physical activity like walking. And so unfortunately, even though if we're doing some physical activity, um, sometimes some, it's having a negative impact on those folks that we take with us on the walks. So you can just see from this picture, um, please don't walk me again, find something to watch on Netflix, read a book, or, but just leave me alone. So if any of you folks have dogs where, you know, it used to be, especially if you're working at home, it used to be, you know, you, before you got, before you left for the office in the morning, um, you took your dog for a walk, you fed the dog, and then you went off. And you may have come home at lunch to let the dog out. And then when you came home after work, you did another, act, another walk with your dog. So you both got activities. But many of us now are working from home and we're, we still want to do our self-care. But I think it's having a negative impact on some of our dogs and our companions, our canine companions. So when he talks about uh, try something else, like you know, you know, binge something on Netflix, and just a, a quick an aside, I don't know if you folks have Netflix, but if you want to binge on something, I just saw this and I'm not, it's, a com, it's not a commercial, but Queen's Gambit, I don't know if some, of, some folks have seen it. It's a story about a young woman, it's fictional, but it's a young woman who starts her life in Lexington, Kentucky. And then she becomes an adult and stuff like that. But it's a, it's a wonderful show to watch. It's seven episodes, but... I'm not being paid by Netflix to do that, but um, that, that could be a, um, a stress reducer is, you know, you know, just watching things that you enjoy watching. So let's actually talk a little bit about the self-care. And with self-care, there is a lot of stuff. If you just Google self-care and self-care plans and wellness plans, there's a gazillion things out there. But what I wanted to do with this slide is to distill it down to three key ingredients to your self-care plan, okay? So that's, that is really important is that, um, what are those three key areas? And since I worked so many years in education, um, I talk in terms of ABC, okay? So you can see here, um, A stands for awareness. How are you feeling? What is your stress level? Okay, um, and awareness is both physical and psychological awareness. How's your physical side of your, your person and your psychological side? And then you have balance, seeking balance in all areas of your life, including work, personal, family, rest, and leisure. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. 
And then the third one is connection, building, upon, building or maintaining those positive connections uh, that create a supportive, uh, a supportive relationships for us. So we want to be aware of how our body is, both physically and psychologically, uh, balance in our lives with the key areas we'll touch upon in a little bit, and then connecting, building those positive relationships. So let's actually go into a little bit of more detail for each one of those, okay? So when we're talking about um, our stress level, as I mentioned earlier, it's that physical or the emotional. And we kind of talked a little bit about these earlier in the chat box, you know, like physical stress, you know, your heart's racing or you can have butterflies in your stomach. You know, can you rate that, you know, say from a one to 10 or using, you can see here a thermometer or um, a temperature check. What is that gauge on your awareness? Now we all have stress in our lives day in, day out, even before the pandemic. But I think with the pandemic going on, it just, it, it increases the likelihood those stressors are causing a lot of problems for us. So being aware of those stress levels is, is, is critical for us. Then the second one, I wanna spend a couple of moments on this area, because I think this is really important. It talks about maintaining balance in all areas of your life. So you think in terms of, you have four buckets in, as part of your life. The upper left-hand corner you see there, that's going to represent work, okay? So many of us are now working from home, um, but that's work. Then in the upper right-hand corner, that represents family, okay? Um, that's, you know, they're a big part of many of our lives, and so we spend a lot of time with them. The bottom right-hand corner, it represents recreation and leisure. Um, I'm not a windsurfer, but that does look like a fun thing to do. So you can put it whatever you like to do. Like me, I like to walk in the park and hiking. So if, this, if it would be, I'd put a hiking picture in there in the park, from the park. Then the bottom left-hand corner is about sleep and rest, and that is so important. And in the middle of this page, you'll see the scales of justice. And I think what's happening with some of us is that we are out of balance right now, okay? And for many of us, the reason why we're out of balance is because of work. And the, what we're trying to accomplish everything now, if we have to do virtually, and everything we have to do at work. Okay, and the way we're interacting with our clients and the people we're supporting. In the short term, even before we had the pandemic, there are probably parts of your job or your career that makes your scales of justice, your scale of balance out of whack. So you may have a, before the pandemic, you may have a, a time task activity that had to be done, say, before November 15th. We'll just pick that date. And so, you know, you only have only 24 hours a day, seven days in a week. You're not gonna get more of the time, but what you're gonna do in the short term is you're gonna to have to take some of that time away from one of those three areas, whether it's your family or your recreational leisure activities that you do um, or your sleep and rest. And in the short term, that's okay, okay? But what we need to be thinking about is if we're not being able to recalibrate and rebalance ourselves where Yes, we have a lot of work that uh, from, we're responsible for right now, but hopefully with some of those timelines coming up, some of that work demand goes away. But if it continues, that's really a concern because then, because we only got the 24 hours a day and seven days in a week, if we continue to take time away from those other buckets, and I think me personally, um, when that happens to me, I take the first bucket I go into to save time and put it towards work, is the rec leisure, right? Doing my physical activity, things I enjoy doing. Because that has less value in my mindset than say my family or work. The second bucket I take from, to make up time for work is my, my sleep. And so some of you may be in the same situation with me where you know, I may get up early. If I typically get up at seven o'clock in the morning, I get up at 5.30, that gives me an extra an hour and a half to work at work, you know, to do that task that has to be completed or I stay up an hour later at work to finish that work, okay? So in the short term, that's understandable. But the thing, and then the last area it takes away from family. And obviously that not only impacts us, but it also impacts our relationships with our loved ones and our friends, okay? So the important thing on this slide is, it's okay in the short term to be out of balance, but if it's over a longer period of time and it's chronic and you're not recalibrating or rebalancing, 
and you're not putting time back into with your family, you're not putting time back into rec leisure, and you're not putting time back into your um, sleep, then that is going to impact your relationship with others, but also is going to impact your job performance. And the last point I just want to bring up on this slide is we put values on these four buckets. And so many of us, I bet you if we ranked them, if we were honest, we would rank the top two in my mind, uh, personally speaking, is my family and the work that I do in my career. Those are the two top buckets. And then the next two are you know, rest and sleep and then uh, recreation leisure. But one of the things we gotta do is change our mindset that we have to give more value to the sleep and to the rec leisure taking care of ourselves in order for us to have better relationships and maintain those positive relationships with our family members. And also it impacts our ability to perform the functions we need to be doing at work, okay? So the takeaway for me is each of these areas are important, but don't undervalue rec leisure activities and sleep in, the, in, those, four, in those two areas because that will impact your relationships with your families and also your job performance. And the last area of my ABCs is connections. And I'll just use these, the upper left-hand corner, you see a picture of a family. And I'm, so, I'm saying this is a, a family celebration around on holiday, okay? And you can see in this picture, it's multi-generational. And so some of these family members, this is maybe a picture before COVID, before the pandemic, where the grandparents live by themselves and then the parents and the kids live someplace else. I'll share a personal experience with you about with this slide uh, my family lives all over the united states but the one holiday we get together and celebrate together is thanksgiving we fly in all over from the country to go to somebody's house for that three-day break during thanksgiving it saddens me that we're not able to do that right now okay and so what my family is doing uh, for thanksgiving we're all going to be spending with our immediate families all over the country but we're gonna be having Thanksgiving dessert together via Zoom. And so we are picking a time on Thanksgiving, say five o'clock or six o'clock, where all my, my siblings and my nieces and nephews and cousins, we're all gonna to get together and have dessert together in a virtual way to continue to make that, maintain that connection. It's gonna be different than it's usually been, but it's important to all of us to maintain those family connections. Then in that second, in that second picture there, that's where we're using technology to help maintain those connections. So a lot of us, you know, before March, the word Zoom was really only being talked about by photographers when they talked about their Zoom lenses as part of their cameras. But since March, we're seeing, um, you know, more of us are using Zoom and other technology to stay connected. And then the third one there is just like texting and, and other ways of staying engaged. It's important that we stay connected with our family because that's a source of strength for many of us. But for some of us, that is a highly stressful source of anxiety for some of us is our family. So who else can we maintain connections with? And it could be friends or people in your book club or social circles where, you know, I'm doing the best I can with my family, but where I get a lot of my connection and the source of strength for me is the connection with family and friends or people in my faith community, okay? So family can be both positive and negative as relates to connection. So connections is just as important as maintaining balance and assessing, you know, assessing your situation. So let's talk in terms of your self-care plan. And there are so many self-care plans out there that there's more than you can shake a stick at. But with this one, I just want you to be thinking about, we talked about the, um, the ways of stress impacts us previously, like uh, physical and social and emotional um, areas of stress. It's really the same way where we want to develop our self-care plan, okay? So what is it that we can do in the area of physical health to help us you know, create that self-care plan? That, that's really important. Or in the area of mental and emotional, what are some self-care strategies in that area? Social and people, those are some examples there lifestyle and spiritual okay so what we're going to try now is what i'd like for you to do for about the next five minutes or so is if you would you can see the five areas if you would just put in the chat box some of the current self-care strategies you're using 
whether some of us may be doing a lot under the physical health and maybe less under the mental emotional. But this is a time for us to kind of share with each other some of those self-care strategies that are working for us. So if you would put those in the chat box, uh, that would be great. Okay. Carly, unfortunately, I can't see it again. So can you just share what some of the uh, strategies they're doing? Sure. So um, I think some people are still typing. So keep, keep okay. adding those. Um, but I, I, I do see some, um, you know, kind of getting outside when the weather's nice, when the sun's out um, can really help um, eating healthier. Um, so those might be more physical. Um, also just uh, reading, taking a walk. Um, family meals. So that social connection. Um, and then, uh, just spending time with friends uh, as well. Um, and then connecting with fr friends through video and, uh, video calls and texting. So that, co uh, connection and social peace seem really, um, important to people. Um, church and Bible study, um, for that spiritual side. Um, and just kind of, uh, engaging in fun activities, whatever those are for people. So. So it sounds like from some of the, um, some of the things, some of the strategies in the chat box, we're filling in, you know, we're putting things in the different buckets we see here, whether it's physical health, getting outside or our spiritual health, you know, um, our attendance in our faith, you know, you know, houses of worship, um, connecting with other people that social people connections, um, and reading. So, those are some really good um, self-care strategies. What I'd like to do is just to spend another moment or two on your self-care plan. So many of us already have a self-care plan and hopefully this isn't the first time we're talking about, this isn't new to you. But I just wanna cover a couple of points about your self-care plan. A self-care plan should not be static. And what I mean by that is you create your self-care plan, you put in some strategies in those different domains and then you just keep doing those strategies, okay? Self-care plans are dynamic and ever-changing, okay? So what you might see uh, in these situations is you may have a thing under physical health, okay, where, you know, you're walking uh, like in the parks a lot, but with the cold weather, that may not be feasible for you anymore. So you're going to have to think of another way of doing a physical activity. And that may be, you know, if you, if you know, maybe doing yoga or doing stretching exercises, in, in the house to, to do some cardio work. So your, your plan shouldn't be static. It should be dynamic and ever changing. And then the other thing is, and this is where my New Year's resolution comes into play. If you all remember, most of us on New Year's Day, we say, okay, 2020, I'm gonna exercise more, I'm joining a gym, or I'm gonna lose 10 pounds or 20 pounds, okay? So I joined the gym, uh, the day after New Year's, I go to the gym the first time and I work out and I feel great. All right, I did my New Year's resolutions. I'm working out more. So we go further into that first week and we do three more days. And then on the fourth day, work comes up, something at work that I have to focus on. I don't get to work. I don't get to work out that day at the gym and I get a little bump. Then the next day, something happens with my child and I have to take my child to the doctor. So I wasn't able to do that work piece. And so now I'm getting backed up on work. So once again, I'm not able to do my exercise. And so what happens is we start to get dejected that, you know, that I, I had the best intentions, those New Year's resolutions, but I'm not able to do that. And I use this as the example. I go to the gym fairly regularly. And so I, I always dislike January. Some of you folks, if you go to the gym regularly, you may experience the same thing in that, um, you don't like January because you have all the newbies. Those folks who have the best intentions, the New Year's resolutions, I'm going to work out. They take up all the equipment, you know, the cycle, you know, you know, cycling machines, the weights and all that. So January is a tough month for the people who go on a regular basis. But towards the end of January, early February, a lot of those people who had the best intentions and resolutions to, to work out more, they've broken those resolutions and they don't go to the gym as much as they used to. And then the, the gym goes back to the normal pace of people who go to the gym on a regular basis. 
my takeaway from this, from this part is don't beat yourself up. If you were able to do that activity, that self-care activity for two days in a row and you missed it third day, I bet you many of us will say, I missed it one day. We need to change our mindset and say, hey, I did it for two days. I know I missed one day, but I did it for two days and I need to celebrate when I did it versus getting on myself when I didn't do it. So that's an important piece about your self-care plan. It's dynamic, it's not static. You need to continue to put in new strategies because some of the strategies that previously worked will lose their effectiveness. And don't beat yourself up if you say, I'm gonna work out seven days a week and you only did it four days this week, then celebrate, I did it four days a week, okay? So that, that's really an important piece about our self-care plans. And then I just wanna give you a couple of resources before we open it up to some of the comments and questions in the chat box. But if you're not familiar with these apps, they're free. The one on the left is called Calm. You can download it onto your phone or you can put it on your tablet. The other one is Breathe, it's also free. Those are some good resources to help you, you know, um, to deep breathing exercises. It can almost be like using it for mindful uh, meditation, okay? The third one here, it talks about mindfulness. I know a lot of you folks are practicing that right now, but if you're just tip, uh, tip, uh, dipping your toes into mindfulness, is this, this is some good information. There's a, a YouTube tube that you can go to that gives you a little quick overview of mindfulness. I know they're even using mindfulness now in kids at schools to help them center themselves and dealing with their ability to focus and stay engaged. So mindfulness is another strategy. Then the last thing I want to share with you, um, for some of you folks, you may or may if you may or not know, you may or not know who Sean Connery is, but Sean Connery is a famous uh, actor who just recently died. But he was in a movie that I loved. It called Finding Forrester. And real quick, he plays a author who writes a book in his early 20s, and it's like a seminal book. It's like Catcher in the Rye, you know, with J.D. Salinger, right? But then Sean Connery's character goes into, he isolates himself and becomes a hermit. And he lives in the Bronx in New York, and he sees this community changing. He wrote the book in the 50s, and now it's in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s, and he sees the change in his community. But he befriends a young person who's uh, in high school, who's a, a budding writer. So they develop a relationship. Nobody knows about it. It's just between the two of them. But this young writer decides he has a fancy of another young person. And, you know, he wants to start a relationship. So Sean Connery, Forrester, tells him an unexpected gift at an unexpected time. And so what the young man does, um, he gets a copy of, of the author's book, which the girl loves, and it's signed, it's the first edition, and he gives it to the girl, and she goes, oh my God, he's my favorite author. And then she opens it up to the, uh, to the uh, acknowledgement page and sees it signed by the author. And she says to him, do you know, the, you know, the author goes, no, I just got it you know, in the uh, bin at the, the bookstore. But that unexpected gift at an unexpected time really was impactful to that young person. Here are two quick examples that I think we can do for an unexpected gift at an unexpected time. One is that I do some work at a high school in the rural part of the state, and a lot of educators right now are really stressed out about um, you know, doing, uh, working at home, doing virtual school or being in person, there are a lot of issues around that. But the teachers and support staff, the bus drivers, food service workers, they're all very stressed out at this point. So what she was doing is she was reaching out to the recent graduates from her high school and asking them, please send me an email telling about who at the high school had a really, who was really on your side and please share that with me. And so those recent graduates are sending back email messages to her to say, oh, please share this with Ms. Jones, the bus driver. Oh, please share this with Mr. Smith, my chemistry teacher. So what the council is doing is then taking those emails and going to put them like in envelopes and give them to those teachers. So think in terms of those teachers or bus drivers or food service workers. That is an unexpected gift at an unexpected time. And I think that's going to have a, a big impact on those people recognizing them. So I think that's an important thing. And then one more thing about an unexpected gift at an unexpected time that we can do for ourselves and our colleagues. It, we, I know that school was doing this 
at the beginning of the school year, at a faculty meeting, they had each person write five self-affirming statements about why they enjoy what they do and why they come to work every day. So you can apply this not in, just in school setting, but in the settings that you work with. What is it that brings you to your job every day? Write those on five, piece, five um, little cards, put those in five different envelopes, and then give those envelopes to colleagues or other people at your work site. And then, and then the expectation is when they see that maybe your gas, your gas tank is a little empty, they give you that card back to you. You open the card and you see, oh, that's right. The reason why I do this work day in, day out is because I like making a difference in those children's lives or in that family's lives. So those are just two examples of an unexpected gift at an unexpected time. So real quick, here's my uh, homework assignment to you is make a commitment to do at least one new self-care activity, okay? Whatever that is, make, uh, do one self-care activity for seven days. And then the other one, which is kind of making that combination with the connections, is connect with that other person and maybe you support each other about your, your new activity, you know, through texting or private messaging or phone call. Now, this is a homework assignment. The, person, the teacher on the right, even though I wear glasses and I have gray hair, I'm not gonna hit your knuckles with the ruler. It's all on the honor system. So I encourage you to try this homework assignment. And if you know anything about habit formation, habits usually start to emerge and be able to sustain up to after about seven to uh, 14 days. So that's my last suggestion to you about a homework assignment. And then I'll leave this to you. I love this quote, many folks know about this. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I want you to do this today. Replace that word citizens with advocates and because you folks are advocates for your family. So this, I'm taking Margaret Meads and I'm paraphrasing her great uh, line. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed advocates can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So, if you want to contact me, that's me. And we'll, we'll include the survey in the chat box. But at this point, I want to make sure if folks have any questions or comments, we have a few moments to try and address those. All right, thanks so much, Joe. Um, so a, a question that we had um, that, that um, was a common theme kind of in the, uh, as folks registered, um, was how, how can we get over the guilt of self-care. So especially when we think about reconciling self-care with our work ethic or our work expectations, maybe our expectations with our, our at home or with our family. So how can we, what, what can we do to kind of get over that guilt of self-care? Yeah. And I, that is a great question. And I, I could really appreciate that. You know, work right now is so impactful to us, right? That we, we are working with really at-risk families right now. And we're going to do whatever we can. We will walk through walls to support our families uh, and the kids that we work with. But, and I mentioned this earlier when we talked about the four buckets, when we talk about work, when we balance and family, we have to give as much value to what we do, maintain our connections with our family and our recreation and leisure activity and sleep. Because let me use this as the example. Some of you folks may know that old story about the lumberjack who's uh, cutting trees down. And he, you know, the first day he goes, his boss tells him, you know, cut down these trees. He cuts down 10 trees and he's excited. He gets good reinforcement from his boss. He says, good job, Joe, you cut down 10 trees. That's great. Come back tomorrow. So I come back tomorrow and I only cut down eight trees and I'm spending just as much time cutting down the trees. And there's another person, my colleagues also cutting down trees, other people. So that first day, we both cut down 10 trees. That second day, I cut down ten, uh, eight. He still cuts down 10 trees. I get, hey, wait a minute. I, I didn't take any breaks, but he took a break. What's going on? Fast forward after, say, four days. Now I'm only cutting down three trees a day. I'm working longer hours. I'm not taking any breaks. That other person's still cutting down 10 trees, okay? And he's taking breaks. And then I go over to him. I say, you know, Bob, how are you doing it? You know, you're taking breaks and, you know, you're, you know, you're not cutting down trees. I'm doing this the whole time I'm working. And he goes, when I take my break, I sharpen my ax. And that really goes towards 
those other key pieces of your self care that, you know, work is important, but if we don't take care of ourselves and give us permission to say, I got to make sure I stay connected to my family and friends and I need to do the rec leisure, especially the rec leisure and the sleep, because if we're not at our best, we can't give our best to our people that we work with. So think in those terms and, and it's okay. You know, if, you, if a lot of us are list makers, okay, that we like to make a list. And if you have 10 things on your list, if you do seven of them, I can tell you most of us say, I missed three things. I didn't do three things and we beat ourselves up. We need to change that mindset. I did seven. Uh, I still got to do those three, but I need to celebrate. I was able to do those seven things and give, give ourselves permission to say, I can't get everything done. I am not Superman or Superwoman. So it's important that, you know, we keep balance in our lives with our self-care practices. Thank you so much for that. Or? I think that's all the time we'll have okay. for questions. Okay. Um, is there anything um, last minute things, Joe, that you wanted to make sure you cover with folks? Yeah. Uh, just as uh, two things. One, anytime I do presentations and the most valuable thing you can give anybody else is time. And especially during your, these difficult times with work and the pandemic, I truly appreciate being given the opportunity from KYA to do this presentation, but also to the folks on the call today that I appreciate you spending the hour with me, okay? Um, that's really the, the, the biggest takeaway. And then also, um, there'll be some resources in there. Um, you know, if you wanna go home, home, you know, you wanna reflect on the PowerPoint or you wanna watch it again, we'll make sure those resources are available. And then also there's one more resource we're putting in the chat box is how to talk to kids around the election and the, the negative impact it can have on some kids. And so it's a wonderful resource. It's for educators, but it's a good resource whether, regardless of what setting you work with. So uh, Carly just posted that too. It gives you about eight to 10 strategies on how the, those conversations and what you can do to help kids uh, deal with, with the, uh, the after effects of the election, whatever way it ends up. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Joe Barjon, for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much to our advocates for joining us today. Um, we also want to thank Aetna Better Health of Kentucky for their support of today's Advocate Virtual Forum. So we really appreciate that. Um, if you are interested in hosting a bounce training um, with your organization, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We are happy to um, to assist you with that. And I'm going to put a link right now um, in the chat box um, to, to view our list, our menu of trainings. And there's a form in there you can also fill out to contact us um, if you're interested in some trainings. Um, so as uh, for a look ahead for next week, we will be discussing um, in next week's forum, Medicaid open enrollment. Um, and that'll be including kind of what's new for this year. Um, and as always, the follow-up email will include a recording of today's forum, along with uh, some of the resources that we discussed today and, and that we mentioned in the chat box. Um, and then also links uh, to RSVP for next week's forum and also for Children's Advocacy Week, which is coming up on February 1st through the 5th. Um, thanks again for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you all.